Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I remember one night seeing Michael Powell of the Washington Post at a housing rally at Boys and Girls High School in Brooklyn. He was the only reporter there. And it struck me that this was the only way that anybody in Washington might know what was happening in Brooklyn. That's why he could be the city's most important writer. It's very important for us. Do you ever think about that? About carrying New York's message? <laughs> Yeah, I mean a bit, and I think that that's one of the, having grown up here, yeah. that's one of the fun aspects about being back here is you get to, you get to zig a little bit when others are zagging, and you get to pay attention to what you like to think are stories that others aren't paying attention to. Of course, Jimmy Breslin was there that night too, so, <laughs> so I wasn't as smart as I thought. Well. <laughs> <laughs> or as far ahead. <laughs> But it was pretty good, he yes. was, and he's never stopped talking about it, so I can see. Um, you, so you're the, you have an office here? Yes, how, yes. How many people do we you have We have ten, 10 people, though it's a little bit of an, uh, that overstates it in a sense. I mean, we have a couple of people UN. who are just up here, right? We have a UN writer, we have somebody who does weapons of mass destruction who just happens to be based here. We have a Wall Street writer, a fashion writer, a white collar crime writer. Um, so it's, it's a collection of people, and I'm the bureau chief, but it's in the loosest sense of the word. I mean, pretty much everyone takes takes right. care of themselves. So you can pick whatever you want to do? Yeah, within reason. And mm -hmm. I cover uh, both the city and then up through New England, New oh. Jersey, New York, some into Pennsylvania. Um, so, I, yeah, it's sort of from the southern end of Staten Island to the Canadian border. So these stories can appear on the first page or they're in the news stories. Right. So they are really important because it really is New York's message in Washington, right? Well, you hope so. Yeah. 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 And it's been an interesting time. I mean, we got back here, um, my family and I, on, what was it, the 2nd of September, 2001. You, no. <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah. Boy. Yeah, I told, uh, I when we were thinking about coming up here, I told my wife, Evelyn, I said, you know, don't, babe, this is going to be great. She wasn't sure she wanted to move back. I said, we're finally going to You were living be, in Washington. Yes. We should say that. And we're okay. finally going to be able to do what we want to do. And, you know, this will be a slightly more leisurely pace. We'll be able to, do, you know, go out to the theater. <laughs> so then it <laughs> and, happened. Right. My credibility took one of many shots that it's taken over the years. Is she from New York? Yeah. She grew up in Queens. Right. Well, you and I were, were comparing notes, and we grew up within blocks of each other and, and followed similar paths with the families. And, yes. Uh, it does, it, does it affect you? I mean, is it a, do you find it's a different way of looking at things? It was great coming back. It's interesting coming back because I, I sort of felt like there's a, there's a period when you come back where the clouds part a little bit and I started to see the city differently. And I must say, now that I've been here three or four years, you can start to feel it closing over again, where you have just enough, I remember when I, to back up, when yeah. I was a, you know, right out of college, I went to yeah. Asia for a year, and I remember yeah. coming back, and there was that sense, sense where I really felt like I was seeing the city so differently. Yeah. And from the point of view of being a reporter, that's a great thing. Yeah where you can just sort of, you, you have that chance to just kind of back it off a little bit. Right. And New York's a hard place to back off. Um, so anyway, yeah. yeah. I, it's, it reminds me of when you're really very sick mm -hmm. and then you feel well and you, life becomes, you have this different perspective about what's really important in life. That's right. And then you forget it soon right, after, forget, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. So what do you think? I mean, you wrote last year when you, I remember reading something about the economics condition of the city. And that was, it was a very interesting article because it said, you know, the bonuses are high. Well, this year they're even higher, the Wall mm -hmm. Street bonuses and uh, the market and all of this. And yet there's incredible poverty here. How do you, what do you think about it now? You know, I guess, I mean, really it's, it's sort of the same thing. And, and I guess to some extent I find the city as sort of a lesser place than it used to be. And I think, in, and, and, the, its problems are more disguised because Manhattan has become such a gilded ghetto. And Manhattan is, I realize when I have friends that come up here from the, the Washington Post, from Washington, is Manhattan really is the face of the city. So to that extent, when Bloomberg or whomever talk about it as sort of this luxury item and this, you know, I mean, they're, in one sense, they're right, because if by creating the image 
they yeah, have in Manhattan, they really do create an image for the city. That, but I think the problem with that, the terrible problem, is that it it utterly sort of disguises sort of the larger problems of the city, and then and and on, even on a better side, the larger the and glorious the identity of the, of of the, the city. city. Yeah, it, I I understand what you say, but you know, recently I've been looking closely at Manhattan. I think maybe it was after reading your article, mm -hmm. or but I think it's striking all of us. The number of stores that are empty in Manhattan, but they're glossed over because the other stores, the the, the stores we see in every city in the world, right. are so glitzy that you don't even notice the diminishing of the smaller stores and stuff. And I think um, if that's is that what they call globalization? I'm not sure. You know, do you know what I mean? I do know what I you mean. We've mean, lost I mean, all the originality. We used to be able to walk down Broadway and see independent stores, or Columbus Avenue was always the avenue on the west side where we both come from. Uh, which always had the little stores oh, that yeah. changed in character. Now it's just one chain store after another. Yeah, I've, uh, it's funny. We moved um, here. My building, the Newsweek building, at the at the bottom of it was uh, Coliseum Books. Right. And I thought, oh, great, this is great. I'll be. And I had about a year. And then, of course, Coliseum Books turned into you know Bank of it's America bank. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's the banks taking. In fact, I was on Second Avenue so in the Village the other day, and I noticed. I mean, there was two sort of good old restaurants had left, and now there were uh, two banks in their places. And I guess there is this homogenization that you see, especially in Manhattan. I don't, you know, you don't see it as much in the rest of the city. But again, I think Manhattan is very much um, the face of the city. So when you write. I mean, if you're if you're reporting the news, you're supposed to you report the facts and everything. Mm -hmm. But you can't really uh, eliminate your feelings, can you? I mean, how does it get it gets affected what you choose to write about? Does it? Does oh it yeah, affect I mean, it gets it? yes, it, exactly. I mean, it gets right. You make choices all the time about what you can. I mean, that's true even if I was based here, but yeah. it's even more so when you're not because you're not writing as often. How often um, do you usually write? Maybe, you know, it really varies. I mean, it can be any time from one week you have three or four times a week to then you might have a couple of weeks where you're working on a piece. I just did a piece on Harlem, and that took a couple of weeks, so I didn't write anything for a couple of weeks. So it can really kind of vary. But, yeah, I mean, when you're an out-of-town writer, in a sense, what you're supposed to do, at least to my mind, is kind of develop a take on a place and develop a certain, and you kind of explore your interests. I mean, what interests mm. you about the city with the hope that by sort of developing oh, yeah. a sensibility and a take, that makes it interesting to your reader, your reader who's not here, who doesn't experience right. the city. So, then look, there's a certain number of pieces you do on, on, you know, wealth or the sort of the, the, bizarreness of New York. But then there's also, I mean, I think one of the reasons I've been interested in, aside from the fact that it interests me anyway, but things like poverty and that kind of stuff, is that those those are faces of New York that the average reader who comes here for the weekend isn't going to see. Is Harlem doing better than um, East New York and uh, um, Bushwick and other places? Well, you know, are... it's, it's a funny thing. Is it, does it have the Manhattan... Yes, I mean the, the, the problem. Yeah. The problem for for Harlem right now is actually the problem of all of Manhattan. You know, brownstone shells are going for one point two million dollars, and it's pushing out. I don't know. One there was one street I was on. There was one hundred twentieth Street, and they had twenty SROs five years ago. Now they have one, and that's being cleared out. And where do those people go? Where do they go? It's really not. It, it's not you were, clear. I mean, you used to work at City Hall yeah. in New York, and you were there with all the homeless stuff and the SROs and all of that. Um, and we've always seen that migration. You, you don't know where they go now. No, do no. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's... They go to shelters or they leave yeah, the they city? they go to shelters. They, go, they leave. I mean, the smarter ones, This one, they were lucky enough in this one particular SRO that I was hanging out in that they found the uh, SRO Law Project. Um, you know, the company right. based on the, on the west, side. Uh, west side, and they were able Got to to reason. negotiate for these guys a, you know, uh, I mean, they didn't stay in place, but I, th I think in the end they got. Have a pretty you written good... about homelessness and for Washington yeah. Post? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And is our problem different from Washington? 
You know, there's a lot of homelessness in yeah. Washington. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, you know, to a certain extent, New York, I mean, I give New York its due. I think New York actually tries to do something right. where a lot of other cities just completely ignore it. I mean, there is a legal right to shelter here, and that's sort of actually something. So to that extent, I think the numbers, you can kind of quantify what's going on in New York in a way that you can't. Connecticut, for instance, much worse homeless problem in almost every respect. No legal right to shelter. Every night in the winter, almost virtually every large shelter in the state turns away people. And they go and sleep in abandoned buildings and all this kind of stuff. But you don't ever hear about it because, I don't know, for <laughs> variety of reasons, including probably that the national media tends to be based in New yeah. York. Um, and New York, it's very easy to follow. And, and New York has a legal right to shelter. So there's sort of a and it has people that make it an issue. And it has people that make an issue. Yeah. Some great advocates. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I was going to ask you, because you've traveled around, I know, in presidential campaigns mm -hmm. and everything. So you've seen lots of the country. Uh, there must be a common thread, though, isn't there, between New Yorkers and the rest of the country? Either we think we're different from everybody, or everybody says, oh, they're New Yorkers and they're different. But are we that different? No. I, I really <laughs> don't. I, I, I think that that's a, I always, I've always thought New York is, sort of the most cosmopolitan parochial place on earth. And I say that as somebody who grew up here, and I yeah, love New York. Yeah. But it's just, you know, there's always sort of this wonderful, I remember when I came back to the city and I ran to some queen, Queen's uh, assemblywoman, and she said, you know, so, so you're glad to be back. And before I could answer, she said, of course you are. <laughs> it's Kathy Nolan, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> good job. Good. Yeah, right. Well, you got them all pegged. Uh, but it's, you know, so I think, Anyway, in traveling around, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the problems, especially in the cities, are not dissimilar. Um, well, why then do we have such a problem, and why do we, I mean, well, even now, with the polarization in politics of the red states versus the blue states, I mean, that's, that's also ridiculous, because in those red states, there are blue people, and in the blue states, there yeah. are red people. So why do we always want to do this divisiveness? Is this the press that does it? Is it the candidates that do it, the political pollsters? What, I mean, how do we get so different that we can't find these common things that we Well, I mean, together? look, I mean, yeah, some of it's definitely the press. Yeah. But I also think that, I mean, it is. The press yeah. loves and anything simple, makes it, makes it easier. And you can kind of say yeah. red state, blue state. And you're absolutely right. I mean, Iowa is, this time around, a red state. It is a red state by 5,000 votes. Oh. Right. So that means you go to large parts of Iowa and you're in so-called blue country, right? <laughs> right. Um, and likewise, you know, you go to Wisconsin, went by five, where I was actually based uh, before the election, went 5,000 yeah. votes Democrat or 10,000 Democratic. So there's huge parts of Wisconsin that are, you know, as sort of Christian right and conservative as places you're going to find in the United States. Then there's also Milwaukee and Madison and places that yeah. are very liberal. I was with John Lindsay in 1972 in, in Wisconsin uh, for his presidential campaign. Oh, that right. was such a disaster. But it was <laughs> so interesting for me to be in Wisconsin. It's so much more refreshing outside of New York City politics because yeah. you're going to pe you talk to people. It's right there, right, right. right in the middle of it all. And right. It's hard. It, it, the same kind of thing, though, has always impressed me about the Congress being in Washington. Um, is that they're not right in the middle of the people that they govern. Mm -hmm. So they, they're, they're, it's different. Is it different? Did you get that feeling there? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there really is that sort it's of that a, inside insulation. the beltway kind of insulation. I mean, that's real. It's yeah. unavoidable, right? I mean, they're, they are a long way away. It affects both sides, liberal and democratic. I mean, that's a disease. It's really, that's, yeah. That, that's a truly bipartisan disease. Uh, and it affects everybody who kind of lives there. I mean, it's this sort of odd little hothouse where there's <laughs> tons of media, there's tons of lobbyists, think tank people. And it's, I mean, Washington's very beautiful, but it's a very small city, basically. I mean, 600,000 yeah. people. So that, well. you know, there really is a sense of kind of everybody knows everybody. And there is this sense that everybody's kind of talking like this. Uh, so that was good then. I mean, that's one thing good to come back to New York. Yeah. And to have the kind of assignment you have, because when you're at City Hall, everybody at City Hall thinks everybody's following what they're Precisely. doing. I, I'm always uh, amused by it. Do you still go on New York One? Uh, every once in a you while. You used to be yeah. on a lot, you know, yeah. and everybody would know, you know, but now, I mean, I never watch. I don't, right. I don't, I have, 
it's so terrible, but I don't know what's going on at City Hall. I do to a degree. I don't know, I don't know if you're missing all that much. I'm, I, I don't <laughs> think so, unfortunately. So are people interested in the mayoralty election in New York? You know, when Rudy left, I mean, much... I mean, yes, of course they are at some level, and Washington is a political place, so there's, a, there's an inherent interest. But I think, you know, Rudy was a big national figure, for better and for worse, and there was a lot of interest in him. There's a lot of interest in Dinkins as the first black mayor, Koch. Um, I mean, Bloomberg's sort of persona So he's the first Democrat so that's different. a Republican. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, right. Yeah. So, right. well, actually... Uh, Lindsay was a Republican who was a Democrat, so it That's goes right. back and forth, right? Right. right. So, do you, so they don't see it as being a test of anything, or that Bloomberg isn't going to go on and run for president, and he's no, not gonna, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly haven't gotten that. You sense. were here, weren't you, when while Giuliani was mayor in oh, New yeah. York at oh, City yeah. Hall? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the privilege, I guess, of covering him for three years. And then you went out, and, and then I went away. And did you find a difference in how he was perceived before 9/11? He was always perceived, I think, better outside of the city. Yeah. So that even that sort of descent into kind of parody that Rudy went into before 9-11, that, that right. year before. I mean, it was starting to hurt him nationally. I was writing about it at the L.A. Times. I mean, a lot of people right. were starting to write about his sort of... Nastiness. His nastiness, <laughs> the sort of the, 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 the breakups of the marriage. Yeah. The, just the, it was, a, it was a, a bad stretch for him. Uh, and then 9-11 um, canonized him, I, I yeah. mean, it seems, across, you know, across the country. I mean, both inside the city, but even more so kind of across the country. Did, it, th did that happen for you, too? <laughs> it didn't happen for me, I'll tell you. Uh, no. Uh, I mean, I thought he behaved quite yeah. well in the, in the, in the yeah. immediate aftermath. I must say, I remember saying to somebody at the time, I'm not really sure what... Mayor wouldn't have behaved well exactly. after that. Yeah. I mean, what are we supposed to presume that you know? I don't know. Ed such Koch a relief or that he was nice. would have gone <laughs> right. and like you know curled into a fetal right. position. I mean, yeah. I'm presuming that they that these are all yeah. you know men who know how to take charge. Um, but I'm just saying. But it, it is just interesting. I mean, Rudy's image nationally um, was just burnished. 60 times over again yeah. by 9-11. What, what always amazes me is how outsiders perceive things. So when Carrick was nominated to be um, to his cabinet position, what was your feeling? <laughs> can I put you on the spot Yeah, you like can. That? Well, you can now because he didn't make it. Yeah, I thought it was a joke. Yeah, so did I. I just didn't understand well, it. How did that happen? <laughs> but people outside of New York didn't think it was a joke. You know, they didn't... But up to an extent, even, I mean, you know, and I say even because in yeah, fairness, the there's no reason my editors or anything wouldn't right. know anything about Carrick other right, than, right. you know, that he'd been a police chief under Rudy and during 9-11. But I think there was a feeling of what? You know, I mean, this, it just, you know, this sort of police detective, he had been a show, political chauffeur, you know, I mean, what were his yeah. qualifications? And no, I think there was actually a sense there that Bush had... Had, had really kind of had, had reached deep, yeah deep into a barrel, and I think uh, and and I think you know also sort of secondarily that Rudy had really over um, overextended, yeah. overstretched, and and yeah. you know pushed forward somebody who just wasn't up to it. So, do you think the city is doing more or less the same as it's always done? You think we're? I mean, we've we've established now that you think New York is more <laughs> conscious of problems than other places, right? That we think New York, that Manhattan deludes us mm -hmm. into really knowing the true condition of New York. But how are we as a city? Are we um, holding our own? I guess we're always the same, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, it's yeah. a big difference. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what do you, yeah. I mean, do you see a difference? I think it's partly uh, the world. Yeah. I think, um, I don't understand globalization, but I think that... Um, the number of people doing business here, the number of foreign co uh, companies that own businesses, the 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 Nash international chains of businesses and 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 stuff like that, all are affecting New York, and that we we are losing some of. It. But then you go out of Manhattan, 
and you see it, although right. it's exciting because it's changing so much. Right. Well, I guess but the that's neighborhoods the, are so. That's great. one of the things I've been so struck by is the immigration oh. is just. I mean, I know you know we sort of talk about it all the time, but you go out to like Elmhurst or it's, to, you know, Canarsie. Right. And when I think about the speed of the change, I mean that that only, fourteen years ago we were doing. You know Howard Beach and and you know covering right. all the kind of the racial problems right. in Canarsie and now I mean Canarsie is you know like a little West Indies. I mean it's just you know it's there's amazing. it's yeah it's just and the food and the stores yeah and Jackson Heights and I mean every part of the city has incredible. You could be in another country right. when you're there. Right. And, and actually, in the neighborhood that I used to do, I used to be tenant organizer, and, and one of the neighborhoods I worked in was East Flatbush. And at the time, East, this was a long time ago, like 1980, 83. Yeah, I guess I left there in 83. And at the time, the neighborhood had just undergone this big change from being basically a white, Jewish, Irish neighborhood to a West Indian neighborhood in a space of like 15 years. Huge white flight, the whole kind of thing. And we were really just fighting to keep landlords from burning the place down. I mean, it was right. really a sense of kind of you were holding on for dear life, and so were the immigrants. They didn't really have a sense yet of kind of this country and what they could do. And one of the first things I did when I got back here was I went out there with my wife, and we walked around in Church Avenue where I'd done yeah. the organizing. And I must say, it made me feel great. Yeah. I mean, there was just it's the, such a bustling, it was incredible bustling community. All the places I remember where it was just sort of, you know, stores that sold, yeah. you know, nickel bags of pot yeah. were now these, you know, sort of thriving supermarkets yeah. and, um, you know, contractors and restaurants. Yeah. It's and all, it, it, it is. was terrific. It's a, it's a little world within this other city. Yeah. And it is true that people outside of the city, when they come here, they don't see that. And that's too bad. Right. Yeah. So. In other, in other words, the political campaigns here are not very exciting to anybody. <laughs> well, <you laughs> and know, I don't know if it makes any difference who gets elected. Right. I don't know. I mean, I think that, look, to the extent that, to the extent that the mayoral campaign, and I guess that'll be on Freddie Ferrer, yeah. the, you know, or whomever is the candidate. I guess he looks like the front runner. To the extent that they can start to speak up for that other city. The part of the city where people are paying 50% of their income for rent, where there's, you know, the very large part of the city and growing all the time that doesn't have health insurance. I mean, all of those things. To the extent that you can bring up and give voice to those people, that's, I think, a real value for any yeah. campaign, um, win or lose. But I do think that my sense is, is that in many respects, Bloomberg has done a, a perfectly fine job as mayor. I think he's yeah. picked pretty good people. But... There's certainly no sense in which he gives, there's not a sense certainly that you get instinctively that he gets a sense for that part of the city, that he can give voice to that part of the city. It isn't to say that his policies are terrible for them or that the yeah. people he's, he's picking aren't making their attempts to, 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 very often in some cases, I think HPD has done a, a quite a good job. But there's also something about kind of giving voice to that. And part you don't, of the city. as you're saying this, I, I was thinking to myself, you don't have to be poor to have that no. ability. I mean, Robert Kennedy yeah. certainly touched the heart. So he got that. Right. The was, Kennedys, yeah. uh, Lindsay, I mean, it was not, yeah, I guess, a, right. a rich man, but certainly right. he was able to do that. I understand it. Yeah. So we haven't talked about the senators from New York, and I remember that you covered um, Hillary Clinton's campaign. Yes. Uh, are people really talking about her running for president? They are, but I think there is a certain sense of, yes, I mean, they are talking about her running for president, and there's a great interest, always has been, in Hillary, in Washington, um, and kind of what she has planned, and, and uh, I guess there's also a sense that it's, I think, that I have, and that a lot of people have in watching her, that it's just, it's hard to imagine, it's sort of hard to figure out how you get from here to there, that she's still... Maybe unfairly. I mean, maybe, yeah. you know, but still seen as such a sort of polarizing figure. Yeah. And she seems to represent things to people. I mean, she's one of those people that you read, th you know, the people yeah. seem to read almost anything right they want into. She and, and Schumer, um, I mean, I thought that Schumer, I mean, he, she was a threat 
threat mm -hmm. to him. But they seem to go along by themselves but keep going, right? Right. On the other hand, here's New York, which is the center of all the activism, and they've got two senators who really are not very active on national issues. I mean, the judicial, I'm being unfair, but right. do you know what I mean? Yeah. That they, they, they're not they're active about. They're both pro-war. Right. They were right. I mean, right. They've and they haven't really taken hold with some of the major issues. And, um, and how we let the Shivo thing go through the Senate without anybody saying anything was really surprising to me from being from New York. Well, you know, they're both, I think they've both taken to heart another New York resident's strategy, Bill Clinton, yeah. of uh, triangulation. And I'm sure it's very effective politics. I'm sure... You know, I mean, it looks like Hillary's going to get reelected quite handily, and she'll do it with a lot of votes from upstate in addition yeah. to down. Schumer, you know, the same. I mean, does very well upstate. But you lose something. I mean, and I guess, and, and that is that sense of kind of who are, I mean, I guess yeah. what I sometimes wonder in looking at both of them is kind of who are right. they? And, and what are, okay, so I understand they can triangulate very skillfully, very smartly. But kind of, and they're good at getting money for the city, and yeah. that's and, right. and for the state. So good. But what do they stand for? And 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 the party and the Democratic Party suffers from that kind of thing, the separation. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes, I yeah. think the Democratic There's, Party is sort is of pathetic at this point. Yeah, practically. They just sort of. I mean, it seems to me they just they want you to. They simply want you to win. Yeah. Well, let's hope that they learn something. Uh, our thirty minutes is over. I can't believe it. And. Um, I'm very pleased that you're writing for the Washington Post well, thank you. Uh, from New York's point of view. And I guess people could w read your column if they go to the website. WashingtonPost.com, yes. It's always always nice to find the Good. occasional, the half dozen <laughs> New Yorkers. Who follow. <laughs> yes, who follow. Well, I hope it's more. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>